Uh, we'll have our next side event occurring right now uh, from the U.S. West Coast to the Ivory Coast, building scientific and political capacity to respond to ocean acidification. And if you don't know exactly what the U.S. Center is, if it's your first time here, uh, the U.S. Center is a public outreach and diplomacy space organized by the Department of State. We have events going on the entirety of the COPs. You want to make sure you grab a schedule or visit us at state.gov slash U.S. Center. If you can't make it to one of the, the events but you want to at least see it, this is live streamed. You can get that link at state.gov slash U.S. Center. And if you have any questions, you can always ask us on Twitter using the hashtag Ask U.S. Center. And I'll say hello to everyone watching on the live stream right now. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's event, Dr. Libby Jewett. Uh, Libby is the founding director of NOAA's Ocean Acidification Program in the United States and the founding co-chair of the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network. So as such, she's had the opportunity to shape both national and international efforts to understand and respond to ocean acidification. Thank you, Tom. Is this working? Ah, here we go. So, uh, got to get all my, okay. So thank you very much. Thanks to the U.S. Center for inviting us to present here today. Uh, my plan is to give you a brief introduction to ocean acidification and to something called the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network. And then I'm going to leave it to my colleagues to talk about the important scientific work that they're doing around Africa. And then we'll be ending with Jay Manning, who is going to announce a call to action, the formation of a new political alliance, which we hope you will um, consider joining. And you'll see the names. I, I understand that some of the words are being cut off at the bottom, but uh, the names of the people who will be presenting, but I'll also introduce them as they step up. So um, ocean acidification is uh, increase in the ocean's acidity. Basically, Everything that goes into the air also goes into the ocean. And about 30% of the carbon dioxide that we've emitted has actually been taken up by the ocean, which in many ways is a good thing because it's moderated the impact on climate change. But we're now learning that that service that the ocean's provided is actually causing some fundamental chemical changes in the ocean itself. So as um, in this graph you'll see um, in the blue line is, over time, the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And in the red line, you'll see the corresponding decrease in pH. And a decline in pH actually represents an increase in ocean acidity. And we're predicting, by the end of the century, about a 100 to 150 percent increase in acidity in our um, world's oceans. And the rate is also an important thing to focus on. It's about 10 to 100 times faster than any time in the last 50 million years. And this is important because we've had increases in CO2 in the atmosphere in geological history, but they've happened over much, much longer time scales. And when they happen over long time scales, the ocean can act, the Earth really can buffer that effect. But when they happen on very short time scales, like the hundreds of years that we're talking about, you know, we don't know if ocean life will be able to adapt to that. So why does OA matter? Well, we already have evidence that shell-building organisms like these tiny marine snails called pteropods um, are showing signs of their shell dissolving in some of the more corrosive waters on, on the planet. Um, this is not everywhere, and that's another reason why we need to be studying this very closely. These tiny organisms actually um, are an important bait component of the base of the food chain. And so as these organisms are affected, as we see increasing levels of CO2, um, it will have repercussions for the entire food web. And also note that coral reefs um, also build shells. And so we're anticipating negative impacts on coral reefs as well, which is obviously very important for many vulnerable areas of the world. So here, um, is a model that's showing a uh, change in what's called aragonite. So aragonite is a, is a mineral, it's calcium carbonate, um, that is important for these shell building organisms. Basically, as we, and you'll see that increasingly parts of the ocean as I move through time are gonna um, go towards a red zone, red color, 
And the red means that that aragonite saturation state has dropped below one, which now does not favor the building of shells. So this is actually, I don't know if you can see it, but this is 1902. You can see that much of the ocean is um, blue. Uh, the polar regions have always been closer um, to that saturation state of one. Then as we move through time, 1968, 2001, um, you can see that there are increases happening throughout the world's oceans, 2034, um, 2034, 2067, 2100. So now we see that by the year 2100, we're predicting that the polar oceans will be undersaturated, have low levels of that aragonite, satura aragonite um, in waters um, throughout the world's oceans. But also note that the all of the oceans have become more yellow. And although they're still saturated in aragonite, they, um, corals actually need super, super saturation in order to put down their shell. So here is where we actually note the absolute change in saturation state. And you'll see that it actually flips where the most amount of change we're actually, that we'll see between the pre-industrial to 2100 is happening in the tropical regions. So this is obviously very important, and we're going to be focusing on Africa um, for regions that have uh, coral reefs and protect and rely on fisheries for, for um, sustenance of their people. So here is a, um, now I'm going to switch over to the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network and just showcase a few of our um, newest developments. So the Global OA Observing Network, founded in 2012, one of our primary goals is to pr provide access to data and data products to the people who need them to make decisions. And um, this is, we just showcased a our, the unveiling of our data portal a few months ago. And in this case, you'll see on the far right over there a highlighted mooring in the Chook, um, off of Chook Island. And down at the bottom, if, if you could see it or you can look between our other panelists, um, actually shows the data from that mooring um, that's related to ocean acidification. So we hope that eventually you'll be able to, to look at any of those platforms and get access to data. And that's important um, as you're trying to figure out your adaptation strategies. So as of um, 2013, we had, we're a network of 150 scientists from 31 countries. You can see the countries represented um, in the early meetings. Um, then as of 2006, September of this year, um, we've expanded to be a network of 330 scientists from 67 countries, um, many countries around Africa. And much of that has been due to um, capacity building training that's happened over the past year even. And so all of our African colleagues here have participated in trainings um, that happened in, in South Africa, in Mozambique, and in Mauritius. Um, they also were able to come to the, our most recent international meeting, which happened in Hobart. And another thing that we announced is what we're calling the peer-to-peer -peer network. So that's actually connecting people who've been doing ocean acidification monitoring with people who are just learning how to do it. And we feel like that one-on-one -on -one connection is critical to build the capacity and sustain it over time. And so without further ado, I'm going to move to our first speaker from Africa after a quick introduction. So Dr. Chibo Chikwilawa is a researcher in the macro and microalgal section of the Marine Research Center in Hentes Bay, Namibia. Um, she's worked with the Namibian mariculture industry in some capacity over the last 12 years and is currently focusing on understanding the relationship between ocean acidification and the planktonic community of the northern Benguela. Thank you, Libby. Um, good afternoon to everyone. And since I only have seven minutes, I'm just going to jump right in. Um, the first slide that I put on was basically to show those of you that are geographically challenged where Namibia is, and it's that little block on the side, but it's also to show you what is so important about this area. And what this graph shows is that there's a high primary productivity. So that will come in play a little later on, and this primary productivity is directly linked to the fact that we have the Benguela upwelling system in that area. 
Now, if we look specifically at ocean acidification activities that have been happening in Namibia, if we look at the literature, there isn't a lot of work that's been done, but the most extensive work that was done was from 2014 by Fleur, where they were actually able to look at the calcium carbonate um, percentage in sediments, which is the figure on the other side. But what was the most important take home message for those of us in Namibia was the fact that they were able to link the aragonite and calcite um, components, they linked that saturation state to upwelling. So the strength and duration of the upwelling was what was going to actually factor into the effects you would actually get from um, ocean acidification effects. Now, the reason why this would be of importance for Namibia is the fact that we tend to rely a lot on non-renewable resources. So in that instance, it would be nice to have an industry that's actually renewable. And because we have high primary productivity, the mariculture industry would be perfect for that because there's enough food for the filter feeding um, organisms, in this instance, shellfish. So they have some studies where they've seen that um, shellfish get to market size in about nine months in Namibia, as opposed to other areas where it takes about a year and a half. So that is one of the components that made the government sort of move towards trying to get the mariculture activities going. And even though it's not subsistence farming, they're focusing on high value target species, but for Namibia, the importance is the fact that you have job creation with respect to this. Now, because we're talking about the shellfish industry and we're talking about ocean acidification, the issue comes in with respect to the spat production. And as we heard with um, what Libby was saying, there are issues with respect to how um, the ocean acidification will affect how they calcify their um, shells. And the reason why that's a big problem for Namibia is that we only have one farmer that actually produces spat for the entire industry. So if there's an area where there's devastation with respect to ocean acidification parameters, it will affect the one farm and that will affect the entire industry. So that is the real life effect of ocean acidification aspects with respect to Namibia. And at the moment, because they realize that ocean acidification is a problem, they're actually starting to monitor some parameters. In this instance, they're monitoring the pH. So trying to see what the fluctuations are like and um, what the variations you'd get from that. And this is in the growing areas as well as in the areas where they grow the spat. Now, even though we've been focusing on mariculture activities, there's still other avenues that also measure other parameters of um, other ocean acidification parameters. And what was surprising to me was that one of the biggest instances was the fact that we actually have a desalination plant, which is in Flotskebagen. So the idea of it is to take seawater and purify it in order to get fresh water. Oh, I forgot to mention, Namibia's got a lot of desert going on, so we have water issues. So this is why desalination was such an important thing. So they actually looked at their information and realized that there was a link between the pH and the alkalinity measurements as, um, in relation to how their, um, what's that thing called? What is it called? I always forget the membrane, yes, the water membrane, how it would work more efficiently. So they're trying to develop more studies to figure out what that relationship is. And I put in the, okay, you can't really see that, but underneath over there, there's basically an aspect of that, even though, yes, there's not a lot of OA monitoring, there's other monitoring going on. And one of those things is the mooring that we have um, in Valvis Bay, which is the south of Namibia. And that mooring currently does um, temperature, salinity, and um, currents. But for those of you that have a spare pH meter hanging out somewhere, I'm taking donations. So I could actually have somewhere to put it on. So essentially it's just to show that yes, these things are there and they can be utilized to a greater extent than what they're utilized in now. So my talk was actually supposed to say, Namibia is here, how do we get into Go On? How do we link together? So if we look at the three goals that Go On has, we can sort of phase into the three factors with the first being that we want to have an understanding of the global OA condition. So from the Namibian perspective, we are already doing pH measurements which are part of a monitoring program, but we could expand further. So that's one aspect that we could actually get going. And of course, the existing infrastructure, so there's mooring, so all I need is a sensor. 
And then the second one is where we're actually looking at the understanding of the ecosystem. And this is what I am the most interested in. So to have an idea of how the ocean acidification effects affect the plectonic community. So that's what I would like to actually focus on. And then hopefully those two activities would sort of feed into the third um, model where we're looking at getting the necessary knowledge and using that information to produce models that are actually relevant for the area. And with this in mind, we'd also feed back into the fact that as a continent, we could actually form and formulate a network. And this stems from um, what Libby was talking about in the sense that we've had three workshops where they've been 26 participants at the different workshops. So we've got quite a wide variation of the different African countries that could potentially be affected by um, ocean acidification. And I think that's my last slide. So I will stop here. Thank you. I don't think we, not at this point. Thank you, Chibo. So next we will have Warren Joubert, and his research focuses on carbon cycling in the marine environment, and he's with the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research in South Africa. His background is in marine chemistry and biogeochemistry, and he's currently responsible for ship-based observations of ocean carbon parameters to establish a long-term ocean CO2 inventory in the African sector of the Southern Ocean. Thank you very much, Libby. Um, thank you guys very much for this fantastic opportunity to just come and tell you guys, uh, I have to stay fixed to this mic, for this opportunity to actually tell you guys about what we're doing in South Africa in terms of contributing to an integrated carbon observatory um, for global ocean observations in ocean acidification. Oh, I have to use this. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, so I'll just give you guys a, a quick perspective of, um, South Af from South Africa on a globally integrated OA observations, and specifically what we as South African contribute to that network. Um, I show a figure there, uh, basically where I'm from in Cape Town, and also showing our um, Antarctic research vessel that we annually go to Antarctica with to basically resupply the uh, bases that we have in Antarctica. I am from the Southern Ocean and Carbon, Southern Ocean Carbon and Climate Observatory in, in Cape Town, and our main role is basically to look at observations in the undersampled Southern Ocean, specific, specifically related to CO2 fluxes between the atmosphere and the ocean in that region. So just some context in terms of what I would like to um, present to you today is just um, to show you where we are, firstly, give you guys a geographical context of South Africa, um, the upwelling that we have on our west coast, the leakage that we have from the Agulhas Current into um, the, and, uh, the Atlantic sector, the overturning circulation, and the new unique habitats that we have around South Africa. Um, I'll give you one or two examples of... Um, South Africa's contribution from a chemical perspective, but also from the ecological implications of um, OA um, in, in South Africa specifically. And then I'll just briefly touch on South Africa's role in um, contributing towards an OA um, Africa, an OA um, Goa, Goa on observations, uh, ocean acidification observations. So um, that's a figure of sea surface temperature around South Africa. We have um, a, one of the biggest upwelling systems um, in, uh, on our west coast of South Africa that we share with Namibia, basically, as, as you guys have heard. And what that does is basically it brings in um, CO2-rich, deep, low pH water into the surface. And our organisms on the west coast basically has to be adapted or respond basically to these low pH waters that we already experiencing on our west coast. On the east coast, we have the fast flowing um, Agulhas current system basically that's bringing um, warmer temperature waters in, um, along our coastline. The volume transport that's coming along the coast there is comparable to um, the Gulf Stream basically in terms of the volume of water that's basically coming there. And then you have that um, interaction of that cold water from the west coast and the warm water from the east coast, which is creating tremendous amount of turbulence and dynamics, which is basically an important um, transfer of heat and um, also CO2 in, in that region specifically. 
Uh, in terms of um, South Africa's contribution from fisheries, you know, um, fisheries is only a small contribution to South Africa's GDP, with um, um, mining, the mining sector and actually um, banking sector being the dominant forces. So what South Africa is trying to do is actually try and increase um, the amount of uh, fisheries uh, resources, basically, that um, towards the GDP. And one of the fascinating examples, for instance, is that already South Africa, South Africa is contributing about 20% of the glo annual global um, abalone production globally. The majority of that is um, um, aquaculture and mariculture based. So we have a real need to actually understand what ocean acidification um, is causing around the coastline of, southern, of South Africa. In terms of infra infrastructure, I think South Africa is quite developed, you know, and I think we have state-of-the-art laboratories um, um, in South Africa. For instance, we have our polar research vessel that we use three times a year mainly to, um, to go to Antarctica and all the subantarctic islands that we have around South Africa. We have a fleet of gliders, um, uh, subsurface buoyancy gliders as well as surface, um, ocean, surface wave gliders basically looking at fluxes of CO2 between the atmosphere and the ocean in um, certain regions around South Africa. And um, the way we're basically using these gliders is, is, is to basically start looking at, um, we're using it in mooring mode, where we basically have a station in the subantarctic zone, which is particularly um, of interest for us, is one of those dynamic regions that's taking up a lot of CO2 from the atmosphere, and looking at the variability, um, subseasonally actually, of, of CO2 fluxes driven by the physics, um, in, in those region. And also, we're already contributing to the surface ocean carbon atlas um, annually, so they have releases of CO2 fluxes in the Southern Ocean specifically. So we're trying to sort of make sure that um, the Atlantic and Indian Ocean sectors of the Southern Ocean is basically covered for CO2 observations in terms of fluxes um, in the Southern Ocean. All right. In terms of economically important species and physiological responses for organisms. Eh? So there's already a lot of um, activity uh, when it comes to experimentation that people are doing with our West Coast rock lobster, for instance. And one of the interesting things that, that, that we are finding with, with our West Coast rock, rock lobster, which I mentioned earlier is quite an economically important species, is, is that it's physiologically adapted in terms of its, 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 its blood content to actually cope with very low pH waters um, in the upwelling system of South Africa. So because it's used to the, the lower pH waters, it's much more resilient in terms of being able to be adapted to the low pH waters in that region. So I think from that we can already learn a lot to, from in terms of how our organisms are, are, are adapted speci specifically for lower pH waters. It's not only that, another example that I don't have on there, on there is, is, is mussels in our, in our region. Um, there are several studies that are being done um, in this region, and I think it's still early, early, early days, early stage of that research, but the comparison between the local uh, mussels that are grown in South Africa as opposed to the ones that are being introduced for, for um, aquaculture purposes, um, at lower pH waters, our local mussels are much more resilient in terms of being adapted to lower pH waters. So the shells are thicker and harder in terms of um, resisting uh, lower, pH, lower pH waters. Um, here's just an example of the, ab uh, the abalone farming that we, that we are doing in South Africa. Um, the pitch, you don't see the picture over there. Eh? Um, the, we have abalone, continuously monitoring of abalone farms, and it's an, 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 an example of, of scientists working closely, closely with, um, with industry in terms of understanding what exactly is the influence of low pH waters on our abalone. And there's an example of um, abalone being exposed to, a, to, to low pH waters of 7.6 roughly for 48 hours, and you can really see the, the electron microscope pictures showing the influence on the, on the shell, shell of the abalone. Um, in terms of an ocean acidification network, so South Africa, oh, we think of ourselves as already quite advanced in terms of what we are doing locally in terms of ocean acidification research um, in South Africa. And 
we hosted, co-hosted with our colleagues the, the OA Africa training workshop in Cape Town in 2015. And we would like to actually expand on that to make sure that South Africa is playing a role in, in terms of ensuring that Africa is playing a critical role in helping all of Africa actually advancing its ocean acidification research, research in, South Africa, in, in, in Africa. And also with that contributing to what's happening with the Global Ocean Acidification Network. Thank you very much. Thank you, Warren. Um, next, we'll have uh, Dr. Naira Shaltut, who is an associate professor at the National Institute of Oceanography and Fisheries in Egypt, and a primary investigator of the meds in the Med Sea Acidification Project, which was funded by the European Framework 7. She's also the Egyptian representative to the IOC UNESCO since 2009. Plans for Egypt, Egypt, in Egypt for joining the Global OA Observing Network. Um, Egypt is lying in the northeast African continent, and um, the only active agricultural activity, our income, from, uh, comes from the area around the Nile River and the north coast of Egyptian Mediterranean coast, which the, where is the, it's rainy. Um, and the main income comes from petroleum industries and the tourism and um, coastal resources, mainly dependent on coastal resources, fisheries, and tourism. So, impacting of, coast, of ocean acidification and climate change on marine environments, although uh, we uh, have Mediterranean Sea and Red Sea where they are, Although they are completely two different habitats, but they both suffer from ocean acidification and climate change. As an example, for, uh, we starting our studies on ocean acidification during METSI project, which is funded by European Committee, um, CORDIS, uh, and it's a cooperative cooperation with many universities in Europe. Uh, we started our study in the Mediterranean Sea, Egyptian coast, from Salon to Rafah, and um, it's our, uh, then after that we started studying the situation in Red Sea to, have, to know where we are now and to start study our studies and forthcoming studies for the impact on uh, the habitats. This is one example of the status in Mediterranean Sea. As you can see that during the last 25 years, the sea surface temperature inc increases by point, uh, the average Mediterranean increases by 0.67 degrees centigrade. Uh, and the figure in the, uh, in the middle, up middle, uh, represents the um, projection of increasing sea surface temperature um, during applying two scenarios by increasing air temperature between 1 and 1.5 as Paris Agreement. And this um, projection, the red line represents the southeastern Mediterranean, which is an Egyptian coast. As you can uh, notice that this area represents projected to have the highest or to be the hottest area in the Mediterranean. And uh, the average temperature in the southeast coast of Mediterranean is expected to reach 29 degrees centigrade. The lower diagrams represent the two scenarios of applying uh, for the Mediterranean for pH decrease in the Mediterranean at one degree, and one degree centigrade increasing in temperature as, as air temperature, and the one on the right increasing in air temperature 1.5. One can notice that also southern east Mediterranean, which is an Egyptian coast, is most suffered from decreasing pH and it's recorded the highest, it's expected to record the highest decrease in pH value. So this is an actual measurement and this is our records for the decreasing in Egyptian coast pH during, um, since 2009 um, uh, until pre-industrial and from pre-industrial and the Egyptian coast from Saloum to Rafah recorded a decrease along the uh, surface to 200 meter water depth, uh, a decrease, an average decrease 
uh, of pH to, uh, 0.14. And this is uh, recorded, uh, expected to be, it uh, can be concluded as be a high decrease in pH. So, as you, as you see, there's the highest impact of decreasing pH, decreasing pH here, yeah, uh, its impact, its impact on the zooplankton and phytoplankton organisms, which are the main fo food web, which means that it affect the, the primary food web in the Mediterranean, which means it will affect the fish production. Fish production is for the Mediterranean cities or for the Mediterranean cities in Egypt in, uh, is the main source of income. So it will affect uh, the Egyptian coast has uh, four main inland lakes and these inland lakes produces about 40% of fish, inland fish production in Egypt. So it, it suffers from pollution, uh, sea surface temperature increasing, sea uh, surface temperature uh, increasing of acidification, salt water intrusion. All these stressors decreases the production of this northern lake and heavily impacted the Egyptian income. Moving to Red Sea, actually we have a measurement for the Red Sea for three years since uh, 2012 and we um, recorded the decreasing pH but uh, unfortunately I don't have the diagram for pH decreasing in the, in the Red Sea for the coastal shore and for the deeper water and it's also we recorded also a decrease in, in seawater pH in the Red Sea and the effect of the decreasing pH in the Red Sea is, uh, influence, is uh, directly influenced the uh, coral reef communities, which is the um, source for fish production and the main source for, for touristic activities in Egypt. And it, in, it affects the touristic income. So it, increasing uh, climate change and sea surface temperature and acidification reduces, uh, causes a reduction in gross and net calcification rate of the coral reef in this area. Also, species suffers from high mortality. The species that, other species that can uh, accommodate themselves and can um, uh, <laughs> be happy with this unhealthy condition, flushing, uh, pays, flushing replaces other colorful coral species now existing. So, we need a good data and on local variability and build future scenarios, understanding of biological responses for each drivers, reinforce the climate change mitigation against agenda with greater emphasis on ocean acidification, improve awareness and knowledge at all levels, including ocean acidification science on the coast and effectiveness adaptation and mitigation actions and dissemination knowledge of lessons and best practices. Thank you. So thank you, Naira. And now we'll have our last colleague from Africa, Dr. Mohamed Idrisi, who is an oceanographer researcher at the National Institute of Fishery Research in Casablanca, Morocco. Um, there he works on topics ranging from geochemistry to sediment dynamics to oceanography. Thanks everyone. My name is Mohamed Idrisi. I'm from National Institute of Fishery Research. So we know all ocean acidification is happening now, and it's bad, except one, of course. So as she Libby said about ocean acidification, she talked about um, definition, causes, symptom, past, and prediction. So we're gonna talk about something else. So what we can do, face of this ocean acidification. In my opinion, so we can fly or fight or nothing. Nothing is face to consequences. Fight is mitigation, work on causes and decreasing the C2. Flight is adaptation, work on the symptoms, by sometimes. So, 
I think what we do now exactly is just buy some time by changing practices, example, aquaculture, or make ecosystem more resilient, like marine protected area, decreasing other sources of stress, example, pollution, or select resilient strength, or protect the hotspot, etc. So for that, we have a like, big problem of scale. So we have two kinds of challenges, global and local. For the local challenges, we have like options which decrease in the CO2. So this, for that, we need global and local data. For the local challenges, we need, we, ha we have like options like management, adaptation. So for that, we need just local data. For all the, those projects and just for better to manage the future. So, as you know, in Morocco too, we have the one of the four upwelling area, which canary upwelling, and for that, the Moroccan sector, fishery sector, has an important potential for national and international development. For that, we have like for the fishery sector, we have two to three uh, revenue international with over 170,000 people directly and one half million indirectly, which represent 2% of our population. For the production for 2014, we got 1,350,000 ton, and for the export, it's around 600,000 ton. But it excludes the coastal, the coastal artisanal fishery with almost 1 million ton. For the culture, we have like more than 468. For the algae protection, we have like around 2,600. But for the agar agar, or just for the export, we have like around 1,000 ton, which represent 10% of the export for the whole world. So for our department of oceanography research, so we work in both sides, Mediterranean and Atlantic Sea, with over 200 stations, and we do that two times a year. And we use three vessels for all kinds of monitoring and oceanographic. For our future initiative research for ocean acidification for Morocco, we are looking for increasing monitoring. We just installed like five weeks ago, oceanographic buoy in the one in the hotspot in Apuling area in South Morocco with multi-sensor like temperature, oxygen, dissolved oxygen, pH, PC2, current waves. And we are looking to, for starting monitoring of pH and PC2 too, on four transect covering the whole Apuling area. Also, we are looking for develop more, more biological experiment and model development. For the international support, I'm not gonna go talk about what my colleague said already. So we got involved on some project already and it's done, like MEDSI projects between 2010, I think 2014, and Carbo Ocean, Carbo Change between 2005 till 2015. We are maybe going to get involved with some guys from England. Carol, she's here. Uh, in a project they call Ocean Gasp, which the aim is to understand how current and projected change in ocean temperature and acidification. And the final one, it's about the I enter I project, which will go to support the global ocean acidification observer network toward increased involvement of development states. This project will be promote capacity building, uh, regional networking and inter-regional networking and data sharing too, and outreach to key to the key stakeholder. And thank you. Thank you very much, Mohammed. So our final speaker is Mr. Jay Manning, who 
is a partner and co-founder of Cascadia Law Group, an environmental law firm in Seattle, Washington. Um, he's led many in had held many important leadership roles in a spectrum of Washington state environmental activities, um, both inside and outside the state government, including, um, importantly, co-chairing a blue ribbon panel on ocean acidification, which led Washington state to implement some very important research and monitoring um, there. He is here representing the Pacific Coast Collaborative, and I'm sure he will tell you more about that. Hello, everybody. Pleasure to be here as the non-scientist in the group. Um, it has been my great pleasure to meet these scientists who are doing such important work and to work with scientists in Washington State and up and down the west coast of North America on this n relatively new, compared to uh, climate change, um, what I consider to be a threat on the, on the same scale. I think what climate change is doing to the oceans including ocean acidification, has um, very dire potential for impact to our society, to human health, to, um, you know, to, to our, the structure of our world as it exists today. And on, unlike climate change, it is not as polarizing. It's an issue that you can still talk about and get reasonable people to listen. Let me just tell you a quick story about Washington and Oregon. In 2007 and 2008, we had an upwelling event that killed all or nearly all of the billions of oyster larvae produced at the two major hatcheries, oyster hatcheries, one in Washington, one in Oregon. They didn't know what was killing the oysters. They thought they had a toxin chemical. They thought they had a virus. They finally realized the upwelling was bringing slightly acidic seawater, slightly more acidic seawater to the surface and was killing all of those oysters. Those two hatcheries supplied all of the commercial growers in Washington and Oregon and many in British Columbia. So right off the bat, it was not just an environmental issue, as you often hear from policymakers. It was an economic issue. It was a jobs issue. It prompted Governor Gregoire to create this blue ribbon panel on ocean acidification, which brought scientists together with policymakers. The scientists were able to explain to the policymakers this is what this problem is, and we have to, and then the, the commercial shellfish growers will say, and it's not about 10 years from now. It's not about something that might happen. It's something that's happening today. And we ended up with a great set of recommendations, um, 42 of them, and we got people across the political spectrum to agree, among other things, that a steep and quick reduction in global CO2 emissions is a necessary part of the cure for ocean acidification. If we had presented those same people with the question, should we reduce steeply and quickly CO2 emissions for climate change, they never would have agreed. So I think, I think ocean acidification provides an opportunity for us to make more progress alongside um, the, the work that we're doing on the climate front. Another recommendation of the Blue Ribbon Panel was we needed to work at the international level on this issue. So, earlier this year, the Pacific Coast Collaborative, which, who I'm here representing, which is the state of California, Oregon, Washington, and the Canadian province of British Columbia, announced the formation of the International Alliance to Combat Ocean, Ocean Acidification. Here's the charter of the alliance. It's brand new. We just announced it. We're here recruiting, and we, that we're, we've handed out some papers to you folks. We would love to have you join the alliance. The idea is we will increase understanding at every level, but especially amongst policymakers, about what ocean acidification is and why it's a problem, that it's an economic problem as well as an environmental problem, and with some commonsensical, achievable steps we can take to deal with it. We announced it at the, uh, our ocean conference. Um, Chile and France immediately signed on, so they're our first two partners along with California, Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia. Our goals are to obviously advance the scientific understanding of this issue. That's what these great scientists and scientists in the audience are doing already. But we need a translator. 
We need some organization or some group of people that can take that scientific inf information and translate it to policymakers so they can hear it, so they can understand it. We want to take meaningful action. It is time. We are overdue. It's not enough to understand this issue. We need it to reduce emissions. We need to mitigate other sources of acidifying pollution like nutrients. We need to adapt to those changes that we cannot avoid. There's a lot of work going on across the globe on mitigation and adaptation, but it isn't coherent, it isn't on a broad scale, and that's what we need to change. We need to, again, this is as much about coastal economies and coastal communities and livelihoods and jobs as it is about the environment. We need to work together to develop strategies to protect those coastal economies. We need to expand public awareness. We need to create a demand in the public that you have to, we have to do something about this issue. And we have to bring more resources to the scientists, to the scientific work, but also to mitigation and adaptation. Two kinds of members, jurisdictional members, those are governments, nations, states, provinces, cities, tribes, First Nations. And then we have affiliate members, academic institutions, businesses, NGOs. So whichever you're here representing, I would ask you to take a look at the document we've put in front of you. Ask, come and talk to me. We could, I could, we could t walk you through what it would mean. We need members. We need people to join us. Ultimately, we want to help and join with lots of other groups that are working on this and produce better, more protective language in the, COP, in the agreement coming out of COP23 that really addresses ocean acidification and other climate-related impacts to oceans at the same scale, at the same rigor that we're taking on um, emissions and, and, and the impacts on climate. There's our website, and, and I, I hope you'll take a look at it. And I hope, I want, I want to say this in light of last night's election in the US, which scares me. And, and I want to say that this alliance is being launched, not by the United States, being launched by three states and a province that have been sub substantially ahead of their respective national governments for years on limiting emissions, on Adapt, adapting to those changes you can't avoid and doing so while being extremely economically successful. This effort is not going to stop depending on who the president of the U.S. is. This effort will, will get stronger over time as folks join us and we try to make this issue at the same scale as climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. So we now have about 15 minutes for discussion. I do want to, um, so I, I actually took the liberty of looking at everyone's slides and digesting them and trying to come up with a quick sort of action message. And um, I'm gonna read through these and then I'm actually gonna ask my panelists if I captured it correctly and if I didn't then then you can jump in and, and say what you think your, your action message is. So. For me, I said, what we don't measure, we cannot manage. Um, for Chibo, I have protect, pr she's protecting Namibian mariculture industry with data from the Benguela Current. For Warren, South Africa supports OA research in the region. Naira, Egypt is working on a plan for adaptation and mitigation to ocean acidification and temperature change. Mohammed, Morocco assists its fishery industry by developing by deploying an OA mooring off the coast. Now, these aren't the only things that they said, but these are some key points. And for Jay, please join the International Alliance to Combat Ocean Acidification. And of, I hope you'll talk to him afterward about that. So um, maybe we'll start and make sure that, do you all want to add into your key message? No? You're kind of OK with that? OK. Um, so now it, we're really open for questions, um, and Tom will be running around with the microphone. So any questions from the audience? Looks like we have one right here. And then you all can use, pass the mic around. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Semi Agarbi from Tunisia. 
uh, and I am a representative of civil society. Uh, but my question, I, I belong to Mediterranean uh, coast, so my question, is there a list of species that indicate that the, the, P, the pH is uh, decreasing? Naira, do you want to take that? Is that working? Are the mics working? Um, for the Mediterranean, yeah. most of the species uh, is under investigation. Most species actually okay. investigated and showed an impact for dissolving their shells, uh, reducing their productivity, and showed mortality. Uh, other species, like an algae, uh, macroalgae and microalgae, is very more than happy with decreasing pH. So some species is happy with decreasing pH and other is greatly affected. But anyway, it's, there's a great, uh, there should be um, a great effort, much be forced, much be directed to completely investigate the impact of ocean acidification for all the species and have a complete figure for all the countries. Uh, so since even we started more than 10 years ago for ocean acidification and more than five years ago for Mediterranean. But still, many, many species didn't, um, not, didn't investigate it yet. So Jay, did you have? Well, I just wanted to say for the west coast of North America, I was amazed when I first got into this how little we knew about the answer to that question. I mean, really important economic species. I asked people, what about Dungeness crabs? And we did not know. In a five-year period, a lot of work has been done, so we do know a lot more. I would say from a non-scientist, generalist standpoint, anything that builds a shell is in trouble with acidification. And a lot of critters build a shell that you don't really think about. But some are more, like Pacific oysters, extremely vulnerable. Mussels in the, on the West Coast, not as, as, um, not as susceptible. But for us, the, the, the two on the West Coast, the two species of most economic importance, that are the three, are Pacific oysters, um, Dungeness crab, and then there is a not important uh, species at all that I'm going to blank on the name, but you're going to remember. Pteropods. Pteropods, which are a planktonic species that are a prime food for salmon. So salmon themselves are not that vulnerable to o ocean acidification, but one of their chief food sources is. So some of the really big ones on the West Coast are very vulnerable. So I think Carol had a, maybe a comment or question. If I can make a, a quick comment is, uh, I believe in the Mediterranean, the vermited reefs are very vulnerable to ocean acidification and warming and uh, a lot of them are actually dying off. And these are reefs created by worms, you know, mm. little worms. So they're not all coral reefs, they're all sorts of other reefs. And different algae make reef type systems as well. But I wanted to ask a question of Ch Shibo. I really enjoyed your talk very, very much. And uh, your observation about local species uh, seemed to to be doing better, um, better able to cope with upwelling was very, very interesting. And it, it reminded me of the first uh, time that uh, the Germans found that uh, the mussels in the Baltic Sea could cope with very low pH waters. And so we thought, oh my gosh, you know, the, the, all, all of these calcifiers can cope with low pH waters. And what they subsequently found out was that that was due to the amazing uh, productivity, the, the amount of food. So I was wondering if your high productive waters are actually the tipping point to, to enable that extra energy for the for your local species to grow better? I think you just start talking. Yeah, it probably is because even if you look at the species in different regions, they grow so much quicker. So that is probably a factor that factors into that. 
but there is not a lot of work that's actually done to actually see what that rate is. Warren, do you want to mention the rock lobster? Did that take a seat? So, in, in, in my opinion on that, I think the, the way in which organisms are adapted, you know, it's, there are several mechanisms, I think. The one is perhaps they are adapted physiologically in terms of how they in, enzymatically extract uh, carbonate from the, from the surrounding waters. And in, so, so I think actually our species that are used to that low pH waters coming in have several mechanisms in which they are actually um, adapted. And then the other thing related to that tipping point between primate productivity and, and, and that adaptation, um, that's probably the mechanism that's that's driving that's driving that um, that adaptation, you know. So, yeah. All right. Do we have right, one question in the middle? Please introduce yourself. My name is uh, Monge Zavetti uh, from South Africa. I work for a company called Exaro, and my question goes to Warren. Uh, Warren, from a South African perspective. What are the main man-made causes of this acidification? And, and if so, what, what are we doing in order to make sure that society at large is made aware of the effects and, and as a result they may change their behaviors, if any? So the biggest thing that's driving ocean acidification is our emissions of fossil fuels into the atmosphere. So what happens is because we're putting so much more CO2 into the atmosphere, the ocean is mechanized basically to take that up out of the atmosphere. And then the chemistry of the ocean is basically changing the hydrogen content in the water, which is basically a definition of the, the pH. So because we're putting more fossil fuels into the atmosphere, that is driving the lower pH that we are experiencing. So what we have to do as a society, and that's why all of us are here basically, is to try and see what's our best approach to try and actually reduce the emissions that we're putting into the atmosphere. I actually have a question from online, so I will take that right now. It's kind of a general question, but I think it could be applied to each of your regions. Um, it's will this kill or harm many marine animals? Maybe take for a second, just list a variety of animals that you, besides one maybe you mentioned, that are also in consideration for being impacted by ocean acidification. In your country. In your country. Yeah. Other ones besides, let's say, mammals or it, it could be any marine animals, any marine animals. So Broad question, I understand. Rock lobster. I mean, so, I mean, rock lobster was one of the examples that I had on, on the slides that I have. But on the, west, on the east coast of South Africa, we have a coral network as well. You know, that's one of the, the other implications that, that might be felt. Abalone is one of them. Um, bi mussels, um, shrimps, you know, all of, if, anything that forms shells, basically, as, as a house for protection, all of those things will be affected by ocean acidification to some extent or another. What about in the Mediterranean? Yeah. Oh, sorry. You go ahead, Kiva. Uh, actually, it's similar uh, that all the organisms that form calcium carbonate shells, even if it's a calcite or a granite, will be affected. So uh, the other things uh, that um, uh, fish larvae, it's highly uh, suffers from acidification. So most of the fishers, fishers, uh, fish species uh, can, can be affected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you want to say anything, Mohammed? For Morocco, we are going to say like about uh, Austria and Shram because our aquaculture right now, it's really developing for, for Austria aquaculture and especially in the South Morocco. So I think it's going to be harmed more. I thank you. We have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, could, could you give us an idea of what animals that eat those things are likely to also be affected? And also with the sea urchins, which tend to go into degraded waters, whether they're likely to be affected because they seem to flourish where everything else goes down. And um, 
is, is the increased ocean acidification in any way adding to the deoxygenation of the sea as well? So in the U.S., we actually have an, an industry on the west coast, well, on both coasts, where we're um, diving for sea urchins and um, selling them as food source. I don't know in Africa if sea urchins, I know a lot of experimental work has been done on them, but I don't know how important they are. really close into it. Um, one of the experiments that we did in Mozambique for our workshop was that we took some... Try <laughs> okay, let like me that. try again. Um, we took some local species from Mozambique and we actually tested them on t three different pH um, measurements and you could actually see what the fish larva it actually distorted their shape. So there is an actual effect, but again, that was just an experiment. So. It depends on the duration that you have with respect to the OA effects at that period of time. But there is an effect on their growth. They don't grow as well as the others, so the survival rate is much lower. Did you want to? So, no, just the point that I also just wanted to make on that is that I think the, the chemistry is quite well understood, but the effect that that has on different organisms, we're still in the early days of starting to understand exactly who's being affected, how things are affected, and understanding the links from not only directly, but also the multi-stressor effects that different deoxygenation, for instance, as and temperature and pH has on organisms, you know. So it's very complex, and we're still in the early inception phases of some countries are a lot more advanced. In Africa, I think a lot of countries, we're still only starting to figure out how these things are affecting our respective coast, coastlines. And I would just say as a, as a policy making political exercise, what I've seen happen and work well is when a region focuses on the most important economic species in their area or, or iconic species like salmon in the Pacific Northwest, like king crab and tanner crab in Alaska, like lobsters in Maine, like uh, uh, blue crab in Maryland, if you can show that a really important economic species or iconic species to your location is threatened, that really speaks to policymakers. So I, I advise all scientists to try to find that species that's going to have the most political impact. Your question about ecosystem and food chain impacts, mm -hmm. when you talk to scientists about, so tell me about impacts on razor clams, which is an important species in Washington, um, nobody knows. There's been no work done on razor clams, literally none. But when you ask about ecosystem impacts, they sort of roll their eyes and say, that's, we're, we're just dreaming about what the, what the experiments would look like to answer those much more complicated questions. But it is intuitive that if a lot of the foundational species are shell makers and a lot of other species feed on them, the ecosystem impacts could end up being bigger than, than all the sort of individual species uh, impacts that we, that we have talked about. Yeah, I also wanted to say that um, we're in the, as far as like trying to figure out the effects as you move up the food web, food chain, we're in the early stages in the US at least, and I think more broadly of developing ecological models that are trying to make those connections. But it's also, again, reinforces the importance of the global OA observing network because we're going to be monitoring the biology at the same time as the chemistry. So as we make those forecasts, we can actually be tracking those changes in the field in real time. So Carol, do you want to say one more comment? Then I think we're done. I think she had one more. Quick, I have a, a quick comment to end. Quick. I, think you, I think you're sitting on a gold mine, Africa, literally because you're surrounded by such amazing uh, contrasting oceans and because you've got these contrasting upwelling zones that have different multi-stresses. And so they are truly a window into the future um, of, of our oceans. So they are a potentially a wonderful experimental ground for us to study those ecosystem effects. So it's really great session that you've put on there. I'd like to congratulate you all. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's a great place to end this. Let's give our moderator and panel a round of applause. Thank you.
And starting shortly here on the main stage, we'll have a presentation on NASA's Hyperwall on human footprints. And then at 5.30 to 6.30 today, we have our last side event of the day, sourcing sustainability, bringing together Red Plus and no deforestation pledges. Again, thank you everyone for watching on the live stream and thanks for your questions as well. And thank you all for coming to the US Center and please come back, thank you. Hey, one. Yeah, I just, I just want to see. Hey, 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 hey. Yeah, we don't have enough. 